Hey YouTube, JP Dillon. Here's something I picked up uh, alongside of the road. As you can see, it's uh, been outside for a long time. It recently rained, and this is just uh, aftermath of that. I've been letting it dry out for about a week or so. Uh, it's a 1981 Hitachi 13 inch color TV. I apologize for the jerkiness here. But I'm in somewhat of a confined shop space. This is a, a CT1304. Average power consumption. Uh, 58 watts. It's got built-in antennas. You see it's a, just an utter mess. This is one of those early Veractors that have the door you can open up. And this one's missing the little tool. It used to be right here. That would allow you to adjust the uh, outer sheath easily. And this one you would just turn with your hands. Uh, this is another tool. I think that may be part of it. So this thing's in pretty rough shape. Uh, initially, when I put it on the dim bulb tester, it got really bright after I initially thought it was dry, so I let it dry for another week or so. Uh, it's best, if you don't know what's going on with these, to take the horizontal output transistor out uh, when you're working with something of unknown condition. But in any case, we're going to take it apart and we're going to open it up, dust it out, uh, see if there's any resoldering that needs to be done, and then we'll turn it back on again and see what happens. Alright, so here's something I have run into now that this screw has, be screw has become stubborn and stuck and I don't want to uh, open up. Now I've already tried putting penetrating oil in there but largely because it's plastic it's not going to want to cooperate. So what I've done in the past, which may or may not work for this, is heat the head of the screw with a soldering iron as I apply counterclockwise force and a downward pressure from a screwdriver and hopefully the plastic will get soft and it will loosen up. If that doesn't work, yeah, I may have to grind the head off. Fun of uh, outside sets. The reason why that usually happens is the water gets in there, the screw rusts, the screw expands, and then it gets stuck. So I'm going to take my soldering iron and I'm going to apply some heat here and just hold it on there for a little bit. going to take a little while. I can see that the oil is starting to dry up around the head of the screw, so that means it's getting nice and toasty. And this might take me two hands, so I apologize if I have to put the camera down. Now we got the screw warmed up, let's see if it'll back out. Do this relatively quickly. Nope, still stuck in there. Pretty stubborn. Let's heat it some more and try two hands. More heat and two hands. It's coming loose. So that's a trick you can use. You can see this screw is pretty badly rusted. Oh yeah. Oop. Forgot it was hot. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see if we can get the cover off this thing. All right, so let's get the cover off and see what's inside. Mmm. Now, as I mentioned before, you take the horizontal output out when 
you don't know much about a set, but I didn't do that on this one. This is really the first time it's been taken apart. When I dried it, I just stuck a bunch of fans on it. So as you can see, it's been outside a long time. Cobwebs. Just get a wire, uh, natural bristle brush and get some of this out of here. dust up around the old turf connection so we don't have any uh, corrosion or excuse me some uh, corona or arc over dust all this out this definitely got a taste of water there's uh, some signs of electrolysis on the back of the CRT board that's not good this was kind of the beginning of the downhill for Hitachi previous generation sets were pretty well made. These ones were starting to head towards more ICs and less discrete components. So let's just dust this out. I could have done this live, but yeah, maybe that's another time. The main fuse isn't blown, at least not from this vantage point it looks like. on this so you can see the damage to the board better uh, and of course you're not plugged in anymore yes those are SNES games you see I do in fact play those from time to time where's this terminating at I guess it's coming up through here there it is Let's plug this in. There we go. Put some light on this. Hmm, isn't that lovely? So, this definitely got wet. We'll see if we can clean that off with some alcohol or something. And hopefully it hasn't eaten the traces too bad. That's not great. All of this cobwebby garbage and stuff. I don't like seeing. Let's look back in here towards the tuner board. Tuner board looks okay for the most part. I'm not really thrilled. Although I suppose it could be worse. There's no bulging capacitors or anything weird like that. Let's see here. Can we just slide this out? Yep, we can. Unplug some of these guys here. Undo this wire wrap so we can get some of this loose. Unplug some of these connectors. Power switch, degaussing. Yeah. Move some of this out of the way. That one's fairly stuck on there. Probably means it's rusted. And then we got this guy back here for the speaker. Here's your IF input, which is soldered in. Oh well. Let's see how much we can get this out. I'll take loose this antenna input. Yeah, we'll just take loose the CRT board if we can. It might be welded. You know, surprisingly, I don't see a whole lot of corrosion in there. That's the lighting, really. It looks like there's funky green mung in there, but there isn't. It looks pretty clean. And likewise, the pins on the CRT look good, too. So that's a good sign that we're not going to have lots of high voltage arc over problems in the socket. Uh, let's move this forward a little bit. Let's see if we can get this up and out. Uh, let's do another undo the ground strap there let's undo the yoke which is over here if I can get it out there we 
we go. Okay. Now let's see how much we can get this up. Still not very much. We're largely hindered by this uh, IF input here. Mm. Well, let's see if we can put the TV on its side without it falling over, and then let's look at the bottom of the board. Yeah, it's really not too bad. Solder connections on the flyback look good. Still got more cobwebs and other junk here. But overall, not too bad. I think I may resolder some of these power resistors here. The solder looks like it was bubbling a little bit. And then there's this connection over here. I can zoom in a little bit. That one looks kind of spotted. I don't know if I trust that one. But otherwise, it looks okay. They derive a lot of voltages from this flyback. So if that goes bad, you're probably screwed. Good luck finding a replacement. Not that it would be worth it. Let's just kind of look over this board. See if there's anything that steps out. There's that monolithic I see there. There's another one over here, which probably does all your video and color processing. There's your IF strip. Very much simplified. Okay, well, no scary electrolysis here. There's no sign of serious water damage. So I'm going to resolder those couple of connections here on these power resistors. And then we'll uh, chemically treat those controls up there at the front, the picture controls, and that probably an AFT or AFC switch, and then put it back together and see what the hell happens. Okay, so here it is all back together, or mostly back together. I resoldered all those poor connections on the bottom. I also took this board off and uh, soaked it in acetone and uh, that cleaned up all the garbage there. There's still some little bits here that are screwed up because of the water damage, but otherwise it looks all right. I uh, touched up some solder connections there too. Finished dusting the rest of it out, put the chassis back in, made sure there was no excessive dust around the high voltage anode. Uh, so really, all that's left to do is uh, hook it up and see what happens. Maybe it'll catch fire, maybe it won't. So, yeah, this is always the fun part. But, you gotta remember that the fuse is there to protect the uh, set, <laughs> which is kind of a joke. I think the old joke was is that the, uh, the set's there to protect the fuse. Anyway, enough funny business, let's plug it in. Okay, so let's see here. We're going to set our picture, aka contrast to halfway, brightness to halfway. Let's turn the color off in case there's colored snow that throws us. All right, it's now or never. I get sound, this is a good thing. Hey, we got a picture. Pretty strong CRT too. Wow. Well that's about all I the best I could hope for so far. Alright. Let's go get the uh, pattern generator and set it up. Okie dokie. I've got my RCA WR64B pattern generator, which I restored some years ago. Still gets regular use. And it's in, been warming up for the last 15 minutes or so, so I'm going to assume it's stable by now. We'll just turn this back on again. Hopefully channel 3 is actually channel 3. I'm not 
seeing squat. Should be on. Uh, that's on UHF. So let's get the little tool thingy here if I can. It's gonna let me. The plastic's gotten so stiff it doesn't want to let the tool out. There we go. Unless that's not what I think it's for. Yeah, I guess that's not what I think it's for. Anyway. Yeah, I'll mess with that later. Uh, looks like they got it turned to UHF. That would kill things. Okay. Yeah, we're getting there. Problem with these varactors is that tuner caps get so damn dirty, it's almost impossible to tune it right. Thing doesn't want to focus. Uh, okay, let's turn on the sound beat so that we can fine tune this thing. Okay. a little on the blurry side. It's got a little bit of a green tinge to it. I'm going to reach back here and adjust the focus control. Well, that cleans it up a little. Much better. Picture's a little crooked. Usually that's fixed by adjusting the yoke back here. Uh, let's see, that just looks like a Phillips. Let's see if I can loosen this while still holding the camera and then rotate the yoke ever so slightly. Uh, let's see. needs to go back just a hair. Okay. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Nice and squared up. Alright. Tighten the clamp. Exerting as little lateral force as possible so I don't mess up my adjustments. Alright. Should be good there. And as most inline tubes go, this has pretty nice convergence. I don't think I'm going to mess with that. Um, now what I will do is look at our brightness control here. If we tone down the contrast and we increase the brightness, the camera really doesn't show, but there's a little bit of a green tinge there. Um, Man, this thing's bright. This has got a really good CRT in it. At about the halfway point, we've got scary amounts of uh, brightness. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn down the screen control. And so that way, what I want to do is set the brightness to about halfway and then back off the screen until we get a better picture, a better black level. And you can see that also kind of messes with the picture and makes the tinge green. The auto white balance is doing its thing so you're not really seeing it as much. 
So I think what I'm going to do is uh, stop this momentarily and turn the auto white balance off and see if we can do a grayscale setup that you can see the difference on. Okay, so with manual calibrated white balance, you can see now that it's got a green tinge to it. So I'm going to go through the uh, grayscale setup adjustments so you can see. Well, I'll instruct you how to do it. So what we're going to do is, is you go back here to the CRT board. And you can see up top here we have blue drive and red drive. And we've got red screen, green screen, and blue screen. At least I think that's... No, it's actually red, blue... Hang on a second. I've got to fix the washer. Sorry about that. That's the joys of doing your laundry while you're fixing your gear. Anyway, you got your drives up here. And you got your backgrounds or screens here. This is red, blue, and green. Now, if you only see two drives, the drive that isn't present is combined with the screen. And you'll want to adjust the combo control first. It makes it easy. Uh, so, what I'll do, you kind of think of the drives for the whites and the backgrounds for the darks. And you can see, I start with the contrast control at minimum so the drives aren't as influential. We're going to turn down the red drive, and we're going to turn down the blue drive. And now you can see it's almost entirely green. Now, furthermore, I'm going to turn down the red screen. I'm going to turn down the blue screen, so we just have a green. Okay. All right. So, now... I'm going to leave the green screen where it is as my reference since at the uh, midpoint of the brightness control we have a green raster with good darks. And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up the uh, red, uh, red background so we're looking at kind of an uh, amber dark, kind of hard to see with the camera. I'll advance the brightness, maybe you can see it. It looks amber to me. What I'm doing is trying to get the luminance of the red and green pixels to be the same, which would be amber. And then we're going to increase the blue so that we get close to close to gray. That's pretty damn close. That looks like gray. Uh, now you can back off on the brightness a little bit and as the brightness decreases see if you start to see a tint. And my eyes tell me there's just a hint of red, so we're going to back off on the red ever so slightly. And so our grays look gray. Now we need to fix the fact that the whites look kind of bluish green. And what I'm going to do now is we're going to crank up the red, red drive. You don't want to do it too high. We're actually going to put it at about the same level as the uh, uh, green control there. It's starting to look a little bluish there. And what sucks is that the camera shows it being almost black and white, but there's definitely a change to my eyes. Yeah, you're going to have to experiment with this. I can't make this perfect for you guys. Trying to hold the camera and do the setup adjustments is tricky. But anyway, uh, that is black and white to my eyes. And now if we turn the contrast up, the whites remain pretty much white. So now let's switch over to the color, color bars. 
and let's turn up the chroma or aka the color and you want to adjust your fine tuning for minimum bar color distortion on the fringe there see how that's bad now that looks good and then you got the herringbone come in to just back off a hair uh, all right and according to the pattern here we're supposed to see yellow orange orange red magenta reddish blue blue etc I've got the tint at the midpoint so it's pretty close You can adjust your tint and your hue to shift things over. Fourth bar is supposed to be magenta. That's pretty close right there. That looks like magenta to me. Now on these Hitachi sets and the Japanese sets, the reds are a little more reddish orange. I'm still amazed at how bright that picture is. It's pretty incredible. Not bad. <laughs> For a curbside find, it actually looks really good. Brighten up the colors a little. Ooh, ah. Pretty nifty. I don't have my DVD player out here with my... Uh, test patterns and stuff but the color bars say that's pretty good so what we can do now is uh, I'm gonna plug in something a little more familiar just off the top of my head which is uh, off the old NES here Super Mario Brothers and then we'll size up the geometry and stuff for the screen and then finish cleaning it up and have a go at it okay so we got the Nintendo hooked up Wow, look at that overscan. Holy crap. That's terrible. Huh. Alright, well, what we can do about that, I believe there was a uh, control in the back here. Let's get some light on it so I don't electrocute myself. Hard to see down in there. But there is a potentiometer right down in that area there called vertical size. And what we're going to do is adjust that until we get the proper height for the game. Uh, let's see, here's my little insulated screwdriver. And I'm going to try to hold the camera and do this at the same time, so I apologize if things get crummy. Now things look much better proportioned. Now the next thing you want to do to make sure you're correct is, is turn down your contrast and brightness and see if you get shrinkage or blooming. Nope, you don't. The uh, DC regulation on this is pretty good. No blooming at all. So that looks much better. Uh, let's also adjust the vertical hold. Center at midpoint there. No blue bar at the bottom. So we got the geometry right. It's an easy way to test your geometry. Uh, you adjust the height so that you're just, there's no black here and there's a blue reference vertical uh, bar down here and you increase it until that just disappears. That's an easy way to do it I always used to use before I had pattern generators. 
So the next thing I want to do is uh, get it to the underground and uh, see what the width is on it. It looks like the width might be a little wide. So looking here, we've got pretty good geometry. Uh, we just about see the edge of the brick here and the edge of the pipe here. So I think this thing's actually ready to go. It's a pretty cool set for being just a on the side of the road uh, find here. So I thought it was going to need a whole lot more than that. It just needed to dry out really. So I'm going to play with it some more and then maybe we'll do some live TV with a DTV box and see how good that looks. Well here it is on live TV. It looks pretty good. But one thing I notice is that it has really poor uh, DC restoration. Which isn't something typical for an 80s set, so this must be like a, a really low budget one. Nice sharp picture. CRT is really strong. Very cool. So I hope you guys enjoyed the little resurrection video. More fun stuff to come soon.